Thank you for everyone for making the effort to come out on this winter evening. We really do appreciate it, and I would like to thank Roy as well for leading in the meeting tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 8. If you're listening tonight on social media, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or even on our own website, Lifeboat website, you're equally welcome and thank you for being part of the congregation this evening. John chapter 8, and we'll begin to reading, uh, our reading at the verse 1. Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might find or might have uh, reason to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up his, himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted of their own, by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath, not, hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. We'll end our reading there, and we'll just bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you tonight for those that have gathered in under thy word. We thank you for what our ears have already heard and for the blessing we've already received. And now, Lord, as we come to study your word, we pray that you will speak far and wide from your word tonight. And, Lord, have a word for each of our hearts. You know how everyone stands, Lord, before thee tonight. You know every heart in the meeting. And we pray, Lord, that you will speak and meet each one of us at the point of our need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From across the land of Israel, the Jewish people crowd into Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The feast begins five days after the Day of Atonement and when the harvest had just been completed and gathered in. It was a time of joyous celebration as the Israelites celebrated God's continued provision for them in the current harvest and they also remembered his provision and protection for their ancestors during the 40 years that they spent in the wilderness. At the beginning of chapter 8, we see the Lord leaves the city of Jerusalem, and he walks across the Kidron Valley to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. At that time, the Mount of Olives would have been covered with olive trees, hence the name. This is the same Mount of Olives that will one day split in two when the Lord fulfills his promise to return again after the great tribulation. Why he went there, we just can't be sure. We know, however, in Luke's gospel that Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Perhaps no one was kind enough or even courageous enough in the city to give him a bed for the night. You know, when the Lord was born, he spent his very first night in a stable. And now as he approached his death, he was spending the night under the canopy of the very heavens that he had created. Perhaps he departed from the streets of Jerusalem just to get his head shared, just to get away from it all and just get some rest. There would have been plenty of noise going on in the city at that time because of the extra thousands of pilgrims that were visiting Jerusalem. Children would have been crying people would have been laughing and chatting around open fires. We also know from Mark 1 and 35 that the Son of God liked to be alone with his heavenly Father. And on that particular occasion, he got up really early in the morning to pray. The Christian will cherish these moments with God, 
And if we're saved tonight, and if we're serious about getting to know God, no amount of textbooks will substitute the time that we spend alone with God. There is just something about mountains and trees when you just want to be alone with your Heavenly Father. Silence and seclusion are great friends when it comes to fellowshipping with God. Early in the following morning, Jesus returns to the city. And as the people gather around him, he begins to teach them. Many of them were preparing to go home from after celebrating the feast, but they had a desire just to hear one last sermon from the greatest preacher that ever walked the face of this earth. This was early in the day. But, you know, day or night, those who seek for Jesus will find him because he's never very far away from any one of us. And tonight, if you want him and you seek for him, I can honestly tell you that you will definitely find him. As he teaches, the scribes and Pharisees interrupt this Bible study to present before him a woman who they say had been caught committing the sin of adultery. And it looks like this woman has only moments to live. It reminds me of the story that took place in March 22nd, 1824 in Madison County, Indiana. And that became known as the Fall Creek Massacre. Six white men had murdered nine Indians. Among the nine dead were three women and four children. The six men were apprehended and tried, and some were executed. One of the men was named John Bridge Jr. He was sentenced to death by hanging for his part in this atrocity. He was to be executed on June 3, 1825. His father and his uncle were to be executed on the same day. John Bridge Jr., along with a large crowd, witnessed the hangings of his father and his uncle as the crowd waited expectantly for a pardon from the governor. But with no pardon in sight, a sermon was preached as the crowd waited. Finally, John Bridge Jr. was led up to the gallows and a rope was lowered over his head. But just then, a cheer arose from the back of the crowd. A stranger rode forward on his horse and looked the condemned man in his face, and he said, Sir, do you know in whose presence that you stand? Bridge shook his head. He said, No. The stranger continued, There are but two powers known to the law that can save you from hanging by the neck until you're dead. One is the great God of the universe. The other is the governor of the state of Indiana. And the latter now stands before you. Handing over that written pardon, the governor announced to him, you are pardoned. In an instant, what had looked like a hopeless situation became a door of hope. John Bridge Jr. went back home. He settled down. He opened a dry goods store, and he died peacefully 51 years later. Can you imagine the fear that must have gripped the heart of that young man as he watched his father and his uncle die, knowing for certain that he was going to be next? Can you imagine the terror as he was led onto the gallows and that noose placed around his neck? It must have been a moment of terror like few have ever experienced. But this poor sinful woman that we've just read about, she also knew that kind of fear. As she's led trembling into the presence of Jesus, she knows in her heart that she is about to die a horrible death by stoning. However, her path had led her into the presence of not, not an important governor, but into the presence of the great God of the universe. And when she met him, everything changed forever. And if you're listening on social media or even here in this meeting tonight, I want you to know that, 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 that what Jesus did for this poor, wretched woman, he will and he can do for you. This woman came into his presence just a condemned sinner. But she left his presence a changed woman, completely pardoned with a new lease of life. We see, first of all, here the accusation that was made to Christ. Verse 4 says that she was caught in the very act. She was actually caught in the middle of it. But if she was caught in the middle of it, then when, where was the other boy? Because she certainly didn't carry out this sin by herself. Had this man been part of the plan, maybe to lure this woman into a trap? Because we can never underestimate the subtlety of the devil just to lure us into a sexual trap from which we cannot escape, a mistake from which we will never recover. Was he now standing here with her accusers, or did he disappear with a bag of money just like Judas Iscariot, the job completed and done? 
It took place at night, just as the sin of adultery so often is, maybe in a car park, up a country lane, or in a home when your spouse is away. And yet her sin, which was done in the darkness, was brought to light. Her sin, which was done in secret, was now exposed to God. Secret sins, you see, are no secret to God. And one day you will be brought before Christ to be judged, just like this adulterous woman. This woman was caught in the very act. She had no defense. She had no solicitor to represent her. And so it will be for each one of us if we find ourselves standing before Christ the judge to answer for a lifetime of sin. You see, it's better for her that she was caught in the act for she could have went on to another man. She could have ruined another marriage. She could have destroyed another family unit because, you see, that's exactly what the sin of adultery does. She may not have thought it at the time, but it was better that her sin should shame her now than damn her later on. Better to come under conviction now than to come under condemnation later on. Adultery is a vile sin. Of that, there is absolutely no doubt. And the effects of that sin, it's felt far and wide. But do you know what the Bible says? Book of James, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of it all. Every one of us is as guilty as this woman this evening. Some of us, yes, we've we've been forgiven. We have received a pardon, but some of us perhaps have not. But you see, nobody gets away with sin. The penalty of sin will always come due, and the wages of sin will always mean death. There will be a payday. The only hope any sinner has is to flee to the arms of Jesus Christ. He offers the only hope that there is in this world and the next because he is the only way. The Pharisees said that Moses commanded that people like her should be stoned. But what what Moses had actually said was that adulterers should be put to death, not that they should be stoned unless the accused was espoused to be married or was a priest's daughter. That's what Moses had said. And these Pharisees had misquoted Moses. You see, we should never take at face value what religious leaders tell us. We need to read the Scriptures ourselves and see if their claims are true. We need to make sure that we just don't believe what our pastor says just because that's what someone else told him at Bible college. We need to check the Bible ourselves and see what God says. Some ministers will tell you that a baptized baby is born again, but that's not true. Other ministers will tell us that we're safe in the arms of Jesus because of a lifetime of good works. But again, that's not true either. In verse 5, the Pharisees say to Jesus, What sayest thou? And that's how we should all approach the Bible. What sayest thou, Lord? Not what man says, Lord, but what do you say? What do you say about heaven and about hell? What do you say about sin and about salvation and about forgiveness and eternal life? This whole episode, of course, was just a plan to trap the Lord and to destroy his reputation among the hundreds of pilgrims that had gathered that morning in the temple to hear him. You see, if their plan had worked, the people would have returned to their homes all across Israel, and they would have declared that this Jesus was a fraud. You see, if Jesus had have said yes that morning, yes, the woman must die, then what would have happened to his reputation of being a friend of publicans and sinners? The common people would have abandoned him and would have never accepted his gracious message of forgiveness ever again. But on the other hand, if Jesus had said, no, the woman should not die, then he was openly breaking the law and he was subject to arrest. This seemed to be the perfect plan. The Pharisees thought that it just couldn't go wrong. But you see, they forgot that they were dealing with God. The Taoiseach in the Republic of Ireland, Leo Varadka, he hopes to have a referendum next summer to crush the Eighth Amendment, which protects the life of the unborn child. He wants to bring in abortion in the south of Ireland. But Mr. Varadka doesn't understand he's dealing with God. These religious men are perhaps like the legalists in our churches today. They couldn't really have cared less about this woman or about her sin or about her soul or even about her eternal destiny. All they cared about was pressing their own agenda, their interpreted doctrine and their brand of righteousness. They were right, so everyone else must have been wrong. 
And you know, things really haven't changed. All Pharisees are the same. And meanwhile, souls continue to perish as Christian, Christians split hairs and bicker and fight and argue. We also see here that the, the answer from Christ, the first thing that Jesus did was to stoop down and write on the ground. There's been a lot of things said about this and a lot of speculation about what it was that Jesus actually wrote in the dust. Was it to frustrate the Pharisees and to show how unworthy they were of a response from the King of Kings? Was it to remind them that the Ten Commandments, which included the forbiddance of adultery, had originally been written by the finger of God and that he was God? After much pressing, Jesus finally looks up and he says here in verse 7, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Instead of passing judgment on the woman, Jesus passed judgment on her judges. There's no point in thinking, you see, that we are better than most people because we're not. You see, God will judge the homosexual. God will judge the rapist, the murderer, the pedophile, the thief, the adulterer. But he will also judge those that are quick to judge them. The Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But the Lord's mission, you see, it wasn't to judge anyone. Back in Luke's gospel, when a man came to Jesus for help regarding the way an inheritance should have been divided between two brothers, what did the Lord say? He said, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his mission. Those Pharisees were lost. This woman was lost. Everyone standing around that day, drawn to the light of the world, they were all lost. But Jesus had not come to judge them. He came to save them from the judgment to come. Never think that Jesus doesn't care for you. He is the sinner's friend. Even in his day, he was known to hang out with notorious sinners. He was accused of receiving sinners and spending time with them. He accepted the hospitality of lost souls that he could no doubt witness to them. And you know, we all need to have time for people, just like the Lord even if it takes up our own time and even if it is inconvenient to us because we prove our faith and our love when we simply have time for people. On Thursday, I had the pleasure for a few moments to stand outside Mary Stokes' uh, abortion agency in Belfast. You know, I can remember the the time that place opened. Some of the evangelical churches actually run busloads to it. But you see, folks, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And the buses are all gone now. And now the only people that are standing outside that abortion agency to protect the unborn child and to have time for single mothers and unborn children standing in the freezing cold are devout Roman Catholics. And what lovely people they are. Just standing there with their mittens on, with their clipboards, counselling. Single mothers having time for people. People like Bernadette Smith doing an amazing work. And you know, they would put most evangelicals to shame. Just having time for people. Jesus proved his love and his friendship for us when he died at Calvary. Greater love had no man than this, and a man would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his very life to save each one of us from hell. The only thing he is concerned about is that in 10 or 20 years from now, someone in this church tonight, someone listening on social media, might be there. Everyone else that day believed this woman deserved to be punished, and of course they were right. But the fact is we all deserve God's justice, but instead he offers us his mercy, which we simply do not deserve. After Jesus spoke, He stooped again to write on the ground. Could it be that this time Jesus knelt to write in the dust the sins that this woman's accusers had been guilty of, which were every bit as bad as adultery? Once they seen their sins scribbled in the dirt, their conscience maybe convicted them. Like the hand writing on the wall that struck fear into the heart of Belshazzar in Babylon, this finger of God displaying their sin in the ground of the temple courtyard, it scared the life out of them. I'm sure they fear what Jesus was going to do next. 
Would he start to single out each one of those scribes and Pharisees and point to them and say, you're guilty of this sin, you're guilty of that sin, you're guilty of the other sin? Was he going to write the names of those in the crowd that had also perhaps slept with this woman? Is it any wonder they scurried out of the temple courtyard with the tails between their legs? The fact was, she was no worse than the rest of them, and yet those hypocrites, they dared to accuse this woman of sinning. Once they seen their sin written in the ground, they probably just couldn't get out of that temple quick enough. And folks, you know, if we think that we are better than other people, we're just like these Pharisees tonight, and we're just a bunch of hypocrites. We must never, ever look down on anyone. Only God sits that high, and God reaches down to help people. If God were to give us a PowerPoint presentation tonight of all the sins that we've ever committed and been guilty of in in thought and word and deed, then we could never show our faces in public again, and we know it's true. The truth is, There's enough sin contained in our very best prayers to send us to hell for a dozen eternities, and we must have that sin forgiven. They went out here one by one, quietly, so not to cause a fuss or a scene and to avoid the shame. But they should have joined the woman at the foot of Christ and begged for mercy. They should have been more concerned to save their souls than to save their pathetic reputations. But what about you, friend, tonight? Will you, like the Pharisees, go out one by one after the meeting is over, too frightened to admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, or will you fall at the feet of Christ and seek his forgiveness? These Pharisees were under conviction. Their guilty wounds had been opened, but they refused to be healed. I wonder tonight, are you under the conviction of sin? Will you allow the Lord Jesus to heal your guilty wounds? These guilty scribes and Pharisees, they tried to get away from Jesus. Is that what you will do tonight again? Try to get away from the Lord? Will you try to run from God? If you do, you're trying to do something that is impossible, something that cannot be done. And where would you go to anyway? Would you run to your minister, your priest, your religion, your church? Did your minister die for you? You see, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness tonight outside of Christ. Finally, we see here the absolution by Christ. In their effort to humiliate this woman and to discredit the Lord, they brought her to the best possible place. They brought her to the very man who could deal with her past and her problems and make everything right. In verse 10, When the last rocket hit the temple floor, Jesus stood up and he faced this sinful woman. He was the only one that day, only one in the world that was qualified to take up the first stone. When she faced Jesus, she was facing the ultimate judge. Folks, do not face Christ as your judge, but face him now as your redeemer, as your savior, as your your deliverer, and as your friend. She had reached a place in her life where it was just her and Jesus. And at the end of the day, that's that's how it always boils down. Eventually, somewhere, someday, we're all going to have to face Jesus. He has given us many opportunities in this life to come to him. But I wonder what you've done with him. My friend, you will either receive Jesus as your Savior today, or you will face him as your judge later on. Which would you rather have? In the end, it always comes down to just you and the Lord. And what you do with him will determine where you spend eternity. The only one qualified to throw a stone that day refused to do it. Instead, Jesus poured out his grace. The religious men had condemned her and considered her as good as dead. Jesus, however, saw something worthy of his love and worth salvaging. All of her life... She had been a subject to the God of this world, the old devil. She had been a prisoner of her own lusts and desires. But Jesus came, and he set her free. Think of the years later as she looks at her own children and her own husband, a family that she could never have had unless she had met the Lord. So many people 
and they've wasted their entire lives fighting for causes that will mean absolutely nothing in eternity. So don't spend eternity wishing that you could turn the clock back and wishing that you'd given your life to Christ. We must all give our lives to Christ tonight. Jesus here called her woman in verse 10. He only used this term twice in the gospel of John, first in chapter 2 and then chapter 19. Both times it was actually a title of honor that was applied to his own mother, Mary. It would be the equivalent of saying lady. It was a term given to a woman worthy of honor. This person, this person was anything but a lady. But you see, Jesus sees things differently from you and I. He sees in us what we can't even see in ourselves. He did not see this woman as she was. He, he saw her as she could become through him. Jesus took this cursed woman and turned her into a Christian lady. She may have lost her reputation, but that day she gained her redemption. When Jesus looks at you, he sees the potential in your life, and he sees what you can be through him. Life doesn't have to be the way it is. It can be different, it can be better, it can be abundant, and it can be new if you only come to Christ. Maybe like this woman, your life has been wracked and ruined by sin. Maybe you're looking for a compassionate Savior, the one who will make all the wrongs right. Well, I want to invite you tonight to come to the Lord. He cares about you just as you are. He loves you and he wants to save you. He wants to deliver you from your bondage and he wants to set you free. Jesus said, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And as a sinner, you stand condemned before God tonight. You're on the gallows and the noose is around your neck. You may even feel trapped tonight trapped because of the mistakes that you've made in the past. But the Lord Jesus Christ will always set the captive free. Finally, at the end of this portion of Scripture, verse 11, Jesus looked at her and he said, Go and sin no more. Not sin some more, but sin no more. You see, if that woman had have said maybe the, a quick sinner's prayer, and continued on sleeping around and continuing to live in her sin, then her profession was a fake. And if you're in our meeting tonight or listening on social media and you're still involved in the sins that you did before your conversion, then it could be that your profession was a fake. And you need to deal with that. And you need to look at that as soon as possible. May the Lord bless these few thoughts to our hearts this evening.